Hello, I'm your host, Brian Callanan. What does defunding the police really mean? Is the Seattle City Council committed to cutting the budget of the police department in half? And what's the spending plan for the recently passed big business payroll tax? Will this be a jumpstart for our city's economy or a major challenge as we recover from the COVID pandemic? Council President Lorena Gonzalez and Council Member Teresa Mosqueda answer these questions and the ones you're sending in too, next on Council Edition. Right now is exactly what we need to be investing. Investing in families, workers, small businesses, and our most vulnerable so that we can sustain this crisis. It is a uh, misstatement and a mischaracterization at best to say that what we are doing here is eliminating all public safety and doing a social experiment. That's not what we're doing here. All that and more coming up next on City Inside Out, Council Edition. And here they are joining us via Skype. We have with us Council Member Teresa Mosqueda and Council President Lorena Gonzalez, the two at-large members of the Seattle City Council. Thanks to both of you for joining me, and I want to get right to it. Council Member Mosqueda, just a short time before we recorded this show, the Council approved a spending plan for the Jumpstart Seattle measure that you sponsored. Now, I want to begin with an overview about where this money is going and why you passed this measure. I have two statements to help kind of set the tone here. One is from the Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness, which writes this. We know that an all cuts budget during downturns only worsens recessions and slows recovery. We know people who are experiencing homelessness need homes. We know investing in our local economy strengthens all of us. Then we have from Mayor Jenny Durkin who returned this legislation without her signature. It is unclear what will be left of our economy when we emerge from COVID-19 next year. Right now, the very employers Jumpstart Seattle seeks to tax are the ones that continue to employ workers and pay the majority of taxes to our city. If you wouldn't mind, Councilmember Mosqueda, talk about the rationale for Jumpstart Seattle and this spending plan during a very, a very unsettled time for our economy. Well, thank you so much for having us. And Brian, yeah. I think it's important to look at what the data shows. Data from across the country, economics, uh, economic experts who have studied recessions in the past say the best way to build yourself out of a recession is to invest. Invest in small businesses, support families, make sure that local governments have the support that they need to care for their most vulnerable. Right now is exactly when we need to be investing. Investing in families, workers, small businesses, and our most vulnerable so that we can sustain this crisis. We need to be able to help people put food on the table and roofs over their heads. That is what the Jumpstart proposal does. We need to build housing and house those who are homeless. That is what Jumpstart does. And it creates a more economic, resilient community and local economy in the long term. We've come together with business and labor and small uh, nonprofits and folks who support housing and immigrant rights advocates who have all said, now is the time to do this, to help weather this storm and make us stronger. Okay. Uh, Council President Gonzalez, I'll get your take on this. The mayor also brought up a potential legal challenge to this measure that could be faced by it as it actually goes into effect in a couple of weeks here. The criticism is that the top tier of this tax at that $1 billion level essentially singles out one company with Amazon there. Are you concerned about litigation at the very least delaying this revenue from coming to the city of Seattle? I do. Um want to say that obviously at the city council we are always looking at how to craft our legislation in a way that minimizes the 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 legal risk with any kind of policy choice that we make at the city council i believe we've done that with uh, jumpstart seattle uh, the city clearly has authority to um, pass on taxes particularly as it relates to businesses and this is a carefully crafted piece of legislation that focuses on the wealthiest corporations um, in the city. And while the taxation rate might be different based on how wealthy you are, um, it is nonetheless a, a policy that is rooted in uh, taxing the wealthiest corporations at the city without singling um, out uh, the small business owners and individuals who carry the burden of taxation in our state and in our city. I think the concern is, though, that you have basically one company that's at that billion dollar level and and that company would feel singled out and that would potentially be the illegal part of it. I, I think that's the criticism I'm, I'm looking at here. Yeah, well, I think, you know, having your feelings hurt 
uh, isn't a legal liability or a legal theory. Uh, Amazon is one of the corporations, one of many corporations in our city and across the country, frankly, that have gotten away with existing and thriving in tax havens. Seattle is a tax haven for large, wealthy corporations like Amazon. It is only appropriate for them to pay their fair share and to contribute to the issues that they have in large part uh, fueled through their unfettered growth and through, through their unfettered ability to continue to line their pockets at the expense of working class families in the city of, Se of Seattle. Fair enough. Uh, Council Member Mosquito, just going down this path, I want your input on this potential problem of companies finding ways to dodge this. I got some great uh, tweets in from Justin and Poole. Thank you for sending those in, guys. Uh, there are also some who have called this the Bellevue Recovery Plan because it'll push jobs out of the city of Seattle. We don't have that regional big business tax. The state legislature, unfortunately, tried and failed with that earlier this year. But if I'm a bigger business, why would I want to keep higher paying jobs here in Seattle? Your thoughts? Well, Brian, I think it's important that we correct the narrative that was just put out there in the previous question. Mm -hmm. The reality is this is a, um, an assessment on the largest companies who have the highest paid workers in Seattle. We're talking about companies who have more than 7 million in Seattle payroll. And the higher thresholds really only trigger once you have higher paid workers over $400,000 a year. You know, there's 720 businesses that you know, are in this category. It is not just one company alone. And many of those businesses we worked with, we talked to. There's large businesses in that category who reached out and said, I get it. Now is the time to invest in our local economy. It makes it possible for our workers to be able to stay in this city. It makes it possible for Seattle to be more resilient in the out years. And it invests in the type of economy we want to see thriving. That's why they came to Seattle for our, our incredible um, support that we've offered for workers and businesses. There's a reason we're constantly in the top five on Forbes magazine of one of the best places to have a business in Seattle. So those employers have come to the table and said, let's do this in the short term. And then let's also look at what we can accomplish at the state and the regional level. I think it's really important to note that the Jumpstart proposal was crafted with business at the table. Folks sat down and identified ways that we could strategically and smartly move forward to address the crisis that is in front of us. If there was ever an emergency, if there was ever a time to invest in our community and small businesses, it's now and we acted. Okay, that, thank you for that. Council President Gonzalez, just to wrap up on this, the process of rebalancing the 2020 budget due to the pandemic and then tackling the 2021 budget coming up in September, a massive task for the council here, like many cities around the country. And I know Jumpstart is, is a part of that. The mayor's office is estimating we're looking at a $378 million funding gap right now between tax revenues going down, the need for more COVID relief too. Beyond Jumpstart Seattle, do you have some ideas about what the council can do to fill that gap? Um, well, I think, you know, Jumpstart Seattle certainly goes a long way. Um, the City Council has also been looking at how we can um, better use our inner fund loan accounts. Um, we're also looking at um, how we can use our emergency funds and mm -hmm. our reserve balances that we have been literally spending decades scrolling money away as a city for exactly and precisely this situation. So if this economic crisis isn't, uh, you know, reason enough to tap into those reserve funds, then I don't know, frankly, why we're saving these dollars in the first place. Right. So I think, you know, right now we, we are going to be really creative about some of how we leverage and use some of the savings we have, how we can sort of responsibly borrow against some of our funds and then repay them with things like Jumpstart Seattle. Um, and on top of that, you know, we're still not going to rest on um, on not advocating for additional dollars to come from the federal government and from the state government. That's that's going to be a critical part of our at ongoing advocacy for additional desperately needed revenue at the city level. Thank you very much for that. This budget discussion takes us to the concept of defunding the police, divesting from the police budget. And Lorena, I'll start with you here because the council has been working on this as well. A few quotes to set this up as well. Decriminalize Seattle and King County equity, or excuse me, King County equity now are saying the city must make a 180 degree turn away from its longstanding pattern of increasing the police budget and instead immediately cut the budget to, general, to generate real public safety and health. Then we have Seattle Police Chief Carmen Best saying this, I do not believe we should be asking the people of Seattle to test out a theory that crime goes away if police goes away. That is completely reckless. 
And Council President Gonzalez, I want to start with you because you have been a champion of reforming police for years, long before your time on the council here. What does defund the police really mean? Are we talking about cutting the budget of the SPD in half, breaking all the structures down and trying to start over again? I think, um, you know, first and foremost, it's important for us as elected leaders, particularly those of us that are uh, non-black elected leaders to uh, really make sure that as we are looking at this question around how policing has negatively and continues to negatively impact um, communities of color, particularly the black community, that it's important for us to, to, to lead in this work together with community and create space on community-driven solutions that are truly going to create community safety. Uh, and, and I think that that takes time. And, and right now, what we are seeing is a clear call from, uh, from many um, uh, people of color-led organizations, black-led organizations, that are asking us to take bold action in this first phase of work related to defunding the police department. It is a uh, misstatement and a mischaracterization at best to say that what we are doing here is eliminating all public safety and doing a social experiment. That's not what we're doing here. What we're doing here is finally, for the first time in the history of this country, we are asking the question about what purpose does law enforcement serve? Who is it intended to protect? Why does it exist the way that it that exists? And is it appropriate to allow it to continue to exist in the form that it currently exists, in a form where people feel that they have consistently been oppressed by the system? Black folks, brown folks, indigenous folks are dying disproportionately at a disproportionately higher rate than white folks who have interaction with law enforcement. And so what we're doing now is creating a scale up of community-based community safety strategies, while we are also doing a scaling down of armed law enforcement that, that doesn't need to be responding to all of the social issues we've asked them, we've demanded that they respond to in the past. This is a responsible approach for us to do. And more importantly, it's the right thing to do. We are on the right side of this civil rights movement of this historic moment to take up the call and the challenge of not just reimagining public safety, but rebuilding it, building it from the ground up in a way that literally doesn't cost us the lives of black and brown and indigenous people in our communities. I'm tired of losing those lives. And that is the entire reason why we see this movement. And I'm gonna continue to stand on the right side of history and follow the calls of community who are demanding us, demanding that we respond um, in, in, in with bold and swift action. Thank you very much for that. Council Member Mosqueda, going to you on this. When it comes down to brass tacks, cutting the SPD budget by 50%, a lot of people have been calling for that. I'm trying to figure out what exactly that means. And we've gotten some concerned people tweeting in about this one too. Here's one tweet that came in. 50% defunding will completely eliminate detective units, harbor units, and countless other units. How do you feel about 1,100 officers being fired for no liable reason during a pandemic? So definitely some concern out there. I, I guess the big question is, do you see the council laying off or transferring hundreds of officers this year? Well, first of all, I think the comment that you read is just fear mongering to a mm. certain extent. I think in some ways it may be driven by people's um, questions or um, lack of knowledge about what it means to scale up public safety. Mm. When we're talking about investing a large portion of our budget that currently goes to armed officers into community organizations, we're making it more possible for people to have access to food security, housing security, for people to have access to mental health counselors. When we invest upstream, we have seen time and time again from other areas around the globe that have done this, that crime goes down, that mm. the need for officers go down. And that not only saves lives, like Council President Gonzalez just said, it also saves dollars. It is more cost efficient for us to invest upstream. It is more wise for us to invest in community organizations that are both culturally and linguistically capable of responding to community issues. It means making sure that detectives, as you just mentioned, mm -hmm. are freed up to do the work that they 
wanted to do when they signed up. I hear time and time again from officers who are calling who say, I didn't sign up to be a social worker. I didn't sign up to be a mental health counselor. But we, as an institution, have asked our officers to do more and more. And as the council president said, we've demanded it. In large part, this comes from federal dollars that were requiring local matching dollars from the early 2010s, 2012. We have to fix a system that was inflated, that was bloated, that was redirecting folks to do work that they never signed up to do, Mm. that frankly is putting more people in harm's way. And when we free up our officers to do what they actually signed up to do versus being on our streets with guns repeatedly for Mm. things like a mental health crisis or a traffic infraction, there is no need for officers to be signing up for those types of situations. So let's invest upstream Mm -hmm. And let's also reduce the number of individuals that are out there with guns responding to issues where a case manager or a social worker should really be responding. Got it. But does this mean layoffs for the SPD? Well, one of the things we will have to look at is renegotiating. And there is a contract negotiation Mm -hmm. happening right now. You know, a lot of us have... um, uh, real interest in asking the question, what is the right size, the right number of mm-hmm. officers to be on uh, in our streets, and how many of those individuals actually need a gun? That is something that this council will be taking up, and it means really reinvesting into community to to right size those investments. Okay, thank you for that. Lorena, back to you on an, another concern here. The federal consent decree the Seattle Police Department has been under since 2012 regarding officers' use of force. Recently, the Department of Justice said the city did not go through the proper channels in putting a ban on tear gas, pepper spray, etc. Are you concerned that any more efforts to defund the police, divest from the police, could create even more clashes with the DOJ and the consent decree process? I would say that that um, we are always going to be mindful of the consent decree um, process, but uh, nothing in the consent decree actually legally prohibits the Seattle City Council from exercising its legislative authority uh, in, in, in areas that are unrelated to the consent decree. Uh, and in areas where it's related to the consent decree, our obligation is to submit um, those pieces of legislation to the court for their review if the court wishes to see those policies. Uh, we passed the chemical weapons ban in the in the city council uh, with a clear record that it was our intention uh, and our understanding that the court would be reviewing that policy because it is a use of force issue mm-hmm. that is related to the consent decree. So I don't, um, you know, I, my hope is that the court will agree with us that mm-hmm. it is appropriate to uh, prohibit the the carte blanche use of chemical war- warfare weapons on our residents who are exercising peaceful protest. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we will um, let that process go through its course and run its course, uh, and we'll continue to exercise our legislative authority as we're required to. Got it. Uh, Lorena, let me stick uh, stick with you, if, if I could, on, on this one. Uh, a question from another viewer concerned about federal officers coming into cities around the U.S., as the president has threatened. We've seen this play out in Portland. We have a question about that happening here. Here's what came in via Twitter. What are we doing to remove the unidentified and unaccountable federal officers from downtown Seattle? Doesn't pay to defund the police and then have the feds come in with the same BS. Thank you for that tweet there. I, I know Mayor Durkin, other mayors across the country have been pushing back on this. Your thoughts about federal officers coming to Seattle and what we can do about that? Well, the city council earlier, we passed a resolution saying that we do not have any in seeking federal uh, um, law enforcement in our own city to usurp our public safety issues here. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that that um, earlier this week, uh, we heard a very concerning comment made by the Seattle Police Officers Guild President Mike Solon um, to the effect that he was inviting federal law enforcement to come to our city uh, because uh, he, from his perspective, saw that it was so effective in Portland. Um, we have to reject those types of um, uh, statements. And in fact, uh, uh, Councilmember Herbold, who is the chair of the Public Safety Committee, mm-hmm. and I just recently sent a letter to uh, President Solon um, asking him to uh, affirm or confirm for us what uh, interactions he has had with the federal government as it relates to requesting potentially assistance from federal law enforcement. Our hope is that he has not done that. It certainly would be in contravention to every single statement made by the mayor, 
statements that we have seen thus far from uh, Chief Best and uh, would certainly be in controversial contravention of this resolution that City Council just passed rejecting um, uh, ahead of time any sort of uh, potential for federal law enforcement. It is atrocious what we're seeing happen there and um, it has no place here and we will um, exercise every authority uh, we can to uh, prevent it from occurring and if it is occurring to make it um, stop as quickly as possible. Thank you very much for that. I'm jumping around to a few different topics here. Uh, Teresa, let me head back to you if I could for a question about the budget once again. You've raised a concern specifically around homeless spending this year and next, trying to make sure the city isn't using a congregate shelter model. The idea of having a large facility with cots on the floor, it's really been a concern during the COVID pandemic. It's always been a concern, I know, in the Seattle area here too. There's this push for more tiny house villages, which have been a very successful way to get people out of homelessness. Will you be able to ramp up enough villages to be put in place over this year and next to answer this concern you have about the congregate shelters? Well, thank you for highlighting this issue. This is critical in terms of life saving. The CDC has recommended that cities across this nation allow for folks to move into individual rooms and not just sweep people from corner to corner or push people into uh, shelters with mats on the floor. When we push people around the city or we push people into shelters with just mats on the floor without the ability to have partitions or individual rooms and 24 seven um, care, you are actually spreading possible COVID or exposing people who are living unsheltered to more dangerous situations um, because of COVID's existence. The CDC recommends non-congregate shelters. The Public Health Department for King County recommends non-congregate shelters. This means working in partnership with organizations who can get folks into individual hotel rooms, hotels and motels. We've seen be very successful. Tiny house villages have been very successful. Any of these options are things that I'm going to be looking at investing in this year's 2020 rebalancing package and in putting more money into in the long run. Um, this is definitely an area where we have to act with urgency. We had funding from the state government, um, from the Department of Commerce in mid-March. It wasn't until mid-July that those dollars actually got out by the mayor's office. And I think the longer we delay, the more risk we are putting our community at, the more risk we're putting those frontline workers. And it is because those workers in places like DESC and Catholic Community Services, they have doubled down. They have put themselves at the max with trying to make sure that folks are safe, but you cannot prevent the spread of COVID by just moving mats six feet apart. That's not how the virus works. It lingers in the air and it is imperative for us to get folks into individual rooms, be that in tiny homes or hotels and motels. And let's also think about this. It's a win-win for those small hotels who have no occupancy right now. And to the extent that we see any of those hotels closing, we should think about purchasing those as a city. Do the smart thing, turn them into permanent supportive housing like we have in past decades. So those are some of the things that I'm looking at and I think it could be a win-win with the hoteliers and saving lives for those who are experiencing homelessness. Thanks for breaking that down. Lorena, a quick question to you about the newly proposed Transportation Benefit District, not on the ballot yet, the council aiming to put it there. I wanna talk about what the mayor proposed, cutting this tax measure in, in half basically for increased transit and this idea to make it a four-year measure rather than a six-year measure. Uh, any thoughts about that? I know with that four-year measure in particular, makes for a big vote coming up four years from now with this and potentially move Seattle up for renewal too. You know, I think originally we were hoping to be able to undergo this um, uh, renewal for this transportation benefit district as a region. Uh, so the original idea was that we were going to do this as a county. So it would be a Seattle King County effort to expand bus service and bus service and transit service for the entire region. Unfortunately, King County decided that they couldn't prioritize this uh, this effort in light of the COVID pandemic. Um, and so I think, you know, I think it's important that we continue to stay committed to renewing the Transportation Benefit District. The reality is, is that our uh, transit um, behavior has modified and modulated because so many of us are working from home as a result of COVID and there is less ridership. And so we don't want to get in a situation where we are pretending as though that's not happening. And so so we have um, right sized the Transportation Benefit District 
proposal to uh, garner the, the greatest support from those who are going to be voting for it. And, uh, and that means making it slightly smaller and, um, and making it shorter with the hope that at the end of four years, we will be able to partner with King County to have a more regional approach around uh, continued expansion of transit uh, services. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Teresa, I'll wrap up with another transportation question for you. Uh, you live in West Seattle. I do. Lorena does as well here. We got a question in about the West Seattle Bridge, now uh, an emergency as declared by the city of Seattle. We got a tweet in about this one. Uh, Fritz asks this. I'd like to know more about the soon to be funded Duwamish Tunnel. Will we bring back Bertha? I think he might be jumping the gun a little bit there, but your thoughts about this emergency that we have with the West Seattle Bridge right now. People are talking about tunnels, a bunch of other ideas. Some final thoughts as we wrap up the show. Well, I think it's imperative for residents, for communities, for small businesses that we figure out an immediate transportation solution for the West Seattle Bridge. Um, I, I was surprised that we hadn't asked for the emergency federal relief from the um, folks in DC sooner, but I'm glad that that request has been made. I think as we think about new strategies to either um, replace or fix the bridge, this is an opportunity for us to think about what we need. Do we want to have the high speed um, rail go across the bridge at some point if we're rebuilding? Do we want to do a tunnel as the, as the reader had um, written in? I think all of these options could potentially be on the table, but we must have solutions to reconnect West Seattle to our beloved city. Here's hoping on that one. Thank you both very much for joining me. Everyone, thank you for your questions as well that you sent in. We'll see you next time on Council Edition.